So I, I, I have you here. I, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask about this whole resurgence of Marvel versus Capcom too. Um, obviously you guys did. I, I said, I don't want to call it a port because I don't feel that's <laughs> the correct term for what you did the remaster, or the, the re-release of it. And it was fantastic. And it was taken off. What's going on with that IP? I mean, obviously it's not up to you, correct? It's up to Disney and Capcom to make some kind of agreement. Yeah. And it's like, in, in some ways, because we're the last ones to touch that game, it, we feel like kind of like the, the kid that maybe is part of a divorce or just like a, a crazy couple, like whatever's going on, like, I don't have any insight between Capcom and Disney. I know them both pretty well. They're like great to work with. And so the opportunity when, when we did this fundraiser and we raised this money, I asked, <laughs> I, I didn't know what I was getting into. I asked online, what, like, what should we be pursuing? What kind of game should we try to do? And, uh, I, what's what's Max's like handle online? A uh, Maximilian dude is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He he mentioned Marvel vs. Capcom two, and that blew up. Like he did a great video on that, and like I don't think I can I don't I can't even read my public email or any of my Twitter direct messages without like having to sift through hundreds of MVC two free MVC two messages from people, which is amazing. But it's like oh my god, that was such that was the reaction was incredible, and I I know that both Disney and Capcom have seen that loud and clear. And we, we've we begun some discussions on that right now and we're trying to see how far we can go. But ultimately at the end of the day, it's really not up to us. It's owned, parts of that are owned by two different really kind of like large entities that have a lot of reasons why they would want or not want to do some of that that we are not privy to. And so all we can really do is just make the best case possible and, and try to make it easy for them and see if they're interested. Yeah, that's the thing. Like you could raise a hundred million dollars, but in the long, in the end of the, you'd raise infinite money. But in the in the end run, it's all about the licenses between those two publishers. Like it's up to them. Like and, and their relationship that we're we're not like we weren't in the room whenever they've had like crazy talks or not or whatever. So it's like we don't know what's really there. And that's to your point. Like money is not something that will probably move that needle. It's really about just like what's fair and equitable for everybody. And it's not necessarily a money thing. It's more like who who's responsible for what and how's that recognized. Do you think that, that raising the money and having this hashtag shows these two companies that there is still demand for this product, even even with ROMs out there and every, uh, different ways to play it? Oh, absolutely. I, I know I know for a fact in our early conversations here that both companies recognize and they're they've seen it. They know, and I think everybody at work. If you're if you're at either one of these companies, I think there's the I'm wearing my company hat, and then also here's what I want to do while I'm here and try to make happen. I think we have a lot of people in the let's try to make this happen camp. It's just a matter of like navigating all that, uh, I hesitate to say red tape, but it basically is all the red tape that's been there for so many years and just try to make sure that like, there's no landmines they forgot about uh, if they wanted to move forward. Do you th I mean, obviously I think because of the merger with Fox makes it a little bit easier. Cause I don't know if you recall before they merged, uh, there was a lot of issues with using certain characters in certain games that uh, Marvel heroes like got completely shut down because they didn't want to pay royalties to like the characters that were owned by this other company. You know, even though it was all under Disney band, there's still licensees in video games and music and television and stuff like that. And they didn't want to pay any of those royalties. So they just took them out and shut the game down, which is really disappointing. Yeah. But now they're all one company. So you figured it would be pretty easy, but I, I guess it's not. Yeah, it's, it's hard to say. Like that, that could very well be the case where it's, it's a lot easier. I know like that's, just from what what we all see publicly from what Disney has said about their acquisition of Fox, that's like definitely a strategy for their acquisition. So we'll see. I mean, we're at the very beginning of something here. Who knows like whether we end up doing it or somebody else does it. Like one thing I know is like the free MVC two movement really did get attention from everybody. And the best thing that could possibly happen here, the best outcome is that fans of that game who are really rabid, if the game comes out, whether it's us or somebody else or by, by whatever means, like they had a say in that and they made it happen. And I, I'm just as excited as they are to see see what happens with this. Do you think that, I mean, do you think maybe, um, like obviously there's a lot of elements that contribute to this, but do you think the, the poor reception to the infinite version of Marvel's Capcom it played into a factor of them not wanting to do any more Marvel's Capcom games? Per, I'm talking about you first. I know you're not in the room in any of these conversations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I'm, I would like, if, if I'm just gazing at what happened there, I don't think that really, at the end of the day, these are two very mature businesses that really look at what's the bottom line and they, they have criteria that they measure it against. Like, will it make us money? Will it be good? Is the quality gonna be, is it gonna help propel the brand? And um, and again, how much money can we make? Like, I think there gonna be two categories for them. But like, I, they ultimately are, are acting that way. There's, these companies rarely have like a, um, a grunt, a, a, like a grudge, because like there's so many rotating 
I'd say there's people who are in roles at these companies that are, are usually there for, I, I was looking one company up, I won't say any names, but it was not related to this game, but it was another company. And I saw that somebody was new in their, in a division of the company that we're getting ready to talk to. And I went to LinkedIn and they have this amazing feature where they say, people at this company in this role have an average tenure of 1.5 years. <laughs> and it was like, okay, a lot of people who are at these companies aren't around anymore They that were part of this. So there's no like angst or any sort of like grudge being held in the in the you know in the culture of the company really anymore it's really just coming down to is the opportunity worth it and is it how much effort has to go into getting clarification on the legal aspects of the game because that's often where a lot of money is spent it's like okay when this happened it was like 15 years ago and nobody here at the company had any experience with it we have to investigate whether we are legally able to do this this or this and that comes with a price tag getting lawyers to look up who owns what parts of a game maybe we don't have the paperwork on certain things so we have to investigate that that can often be as much, if not more, than the budget of the whole game itself. And so that's where a lot of stuff dies on the vine. And so you're hoping that when you get into some of these things that that's all cleared up and it's been tidied up with other things. So when we look at something like Marvel vs. Capcom 2, we look out there and say, oh, there's been other Marvel games in the recent in recent years that were older games, like Arcade 1-Up and all that sort of stuff that are out there. So that means there's probably some clarity on the legal aspects of it. So you just cross your fingers and hope that means that. With that in mind, that's how we kind of sort through and like, is this worth it? And so look at Marvel vs. Capcom 2, it's like, this is probably worth it because Marvel, as big as they are, they're really tidying up the house clearly because like they're doing a lot of marketing, a lot of promotion, but also they're doing a lot of back catalog plays anyway with toys and everything. So there's probably a lot of effort being put there already. You know, it's funny you mentioned Arcade 1-Up because I know for a fact that when they released their Turtles cabinet, it was like a plethora. They had to do a ton of that legal detective work because apparently the song is not is is licensed. It's not owned yep. by Nickelodeon. It's licensed by a third party, and no one can find out who who owned the song, right? Who they can pay to license the song. It was weird. And then also like the actors on the cabinet, separate contracts. It wasn't owned by yep. you know the company at the time. So like it's and it's that stuff. If you slip up and start assembly line, and start printing out and making money, you could get sued for millions of dollars in damages, and then go bankrupt. That's, yeah, that's been going on for a long time. Like one of the earliest games that I had that experience with was when we were doing a version of Frogger, the arcade game. And Frogger has all this music in the game that some of it sounds like just old 1800s music and popular songs, you know, some of it didn't quite recognize. And it turns out some of those songs were based off of popular Japanese children's show songs. And so they didn't own the rights to those. And then ultimately, at the end of the day, hardly any of the songs in Frogger that were like big staples of what that game was were actually things they could use. So we ended up having to replace the music, which is really unfortunate because a lot of people, when they think of Frogger, if you go back that, that far ago, you'll you find yourself still today whistling a lot of the songs from that original game. And if you go and download Frogger and play it now, you're like, this, this isn't the music I remember. What's what's your vision if you had your way for the uh, for the re-release of Marvel's Capcom 2? You can get it out of limbo. Are we looking at like, you know, just re-releasing it, maybe cleaning it up a bit? Or are we going to look at like an entire rebuild like we did for Medieval? You know, the I... I I'd say there's probably some challenges in doing an entire rebuild and it's not because we wouldn't be able to do it or it'd be like hard to do or anything like that. What it really comes down to is it's a lot easier for them to say yes to a project like that if it's something that's very similar to what it was. The minute you start reworking artwork, adding new characters and all stuff, there's a whole new line of approvals that need to happen. And I can imagine at Marvel, who's very busy right now, they would almost look at that as like, that's a lot of work. And the return on this is not like the kind of returns we're seeing on films and shows and all this stuff. So with their limited capacity to say yes to things and manage them, that makes it like less appealing. I, I would, this is just me thinking out loud on this and some of the conversations we had, so it's less appealing. So what we'd probably have to do, and this is just a guess, is we'd probably have to keep them pretty intact, make them as similar as possible to what they were, but we can do things like, let's update the the net code for the games. Like the last version we did, it had decent net code, but let's go, let's modernize it even more because there's been advances since fix that up. The last version of MVC2 that we did was in 16.9. So let's see yeah, how that cut looks. Off. I remember it cut off yeah. on the sides, yeah. So give people options to do either or with that too. And if we do that, um, see how that looks. And then also what happens, can we up the frame rate? Could we possibly up the frame rate? Uh, as far as like backgrounds, does that look good or not? Like it may look terrible. Maybe you have to keep it at the frame rate it needs to like kind of match with the sprite work and like that. So it's really gonna be exploring all these potential things we could do that are more automated processes on the game that can help enhance it. But um, the minute we start going to that category that puts it puts up red flags with the license holders, then we're in trouble. So we do that and say we go after all the previous Marvel games as well and try to include them in a big bundle and do uh, a, like a deep dive documentary on the making of the games and the behind the scenes and get as much materials as we usually do, like go out there and get design materials, uh, production artwork, all that stuff, try to cram all that in there too. And then 
I think like we try to offer up training modes and get some of the people from the, uh, I'd say some of the top people from the fighting community, particularly for this game, to not only do interviews, but also participate almost like a Peloton almost, uh, the, the training mode. So you have, like, you're being trained by the best in the fighting game community. It'd be amazing to have them as uh, some interactive element of the game to help train uh, people on specific characters and, and that sort of thing. I would basically start there and then as we're exploring it and see what we have, what other things kind of come up, what we generally do is like, we're looking at either source code or we're looking at these games and how they work and we determine modes beyond it. Do we add a tournament mode? Do we add like a robust spectator thing or do we, like, whatever we do, we just have to make sure it's going to work well and it's what, you know, it's got to be something the fans want. And so if we were to get MVC2 or in the other Marvel games, it would start by the archaeological dig of everything that's out there about the games and also reaching out to key members of the fighting game community to be like, okay, let's, we're working on a feature set. What can we do? And like educate them also on like what we can and can't do. What are the limits we can do with the license? Yeah, it's interesting because like you mentioned, for some reason, MVC2 is the one that everyone's like, everyone wants that as an arcade one-up cabinet but they are taking their sweet ass time with it. And either that's because they're taking their sweet ass time with it or because like there's definitely some kind of licensing hell that it's in that nobody knows about except the attorneys. You know, yeah. like... <laughs> there's a good chance that if like, say we got the opportunity to do NBC2, that means RK1 would probably get the opportunity as well because that just will then knock down all the roadblocks for everybody and make it uh, open for... The other thing too with NBC2 is... Uh, Depending, it, it will require, if you're going to go online, it's probably going to require some more robust hardware. And so there's probably, if, if I were Arcade 1-Up, I'd probably be thinking also about like, how much does the hardware cost to support a game that would have rollback netcode and everything else when you play online with their live services? And that game is a pretty complicated game. How much money have you raised so far for the for the awareness of the MVC2 campaign? <laughs> well, our, our campaign, our general campaign, which was to go after things like this, we're at about 9.6 million right now. And we have about 20, I don't know, like 25 or something like that days left. And we're racing to announce, we're trying to get our licensing uh, announcements before the end of the race. So we can try to give an extra boost to it because we're working, we're chasing some pretty exciting things. MVC2 being one of those things that we'd love to be able to like get some progress on. I just don't know if that would be, that would happen in time before the campaign ends. Well, you know, like, like and from perspective wise, for a game that's over 21 years old, that's a really impressive number for a game that old. Like the, for that I demand, know. that's really <laughs> impressive. I know. And it, it, the MVC2, it's, it's funny because MVC2 came, it came up about halfway through this race. So what is like, I got to credit, like, the, just the potential of being able to do a game like that, like, added a lot to the awareness and everything of this this fundraiser. So even if we don't end up doing MVC2 and whatever happens with that, um, ultimately, the MVC2 campaign thing was a big help to us no matter what. And we're going to try to go after everything that's going to keep that group happy <laughs> as much as we can. So we've got other things. we got other uh, irons in the fire in that category, in that genre that we're trying to also make happen. So before I go, can you talk about uh, anything else you're currently working on that you're allowed to talk about? Anything currently in the works coming up? Any new partnerships you can mention? Um, we're really close to being able to announce those, but like we're, I can say, we just said this in an update too. We are pursuing, we're pursuing over 70 licenses right now. And that's growing. We just added about three or four today. And we're in negotiations uh, with about 20, now about 25 of those. And as we're doing this, we're, we're basically... We've got a huge process underway. This is more than we were anticipating, but we, we've got it kind of under control where we're trying to figure out what's going to be the best return on investment for investors. That's a big key factor. And for that to work, it means we're going after some of like some bigger games. And those bigger games where they fall off the list is if like, say the licensor's like, we want 80% of the revenue. It's like, well, that doesn't give our investors any money, so we can't do that. Um, so we're spending a little bit of time here choosing which ones fit on the roadmap, which ones don't, and also what are the best deals, but making sure there's something everybody wants at the same time. And so it's been quite a process, but we've signed, or we're about to sign our first two smaller projects and our kind of like mid-tier, mid-size project is uh, probably a week or two out. And if, if we can get that locked in, we're gonna do a, a decent update with those titles so people can see what we're going after. Nice, and where can they go to support this MVC2 campaign? You can go to the go to Republic's website. Um, you know, I don't even have it up, so it's I think it's just Republic.com. I'll put a link um, in the description below. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be great. And like you'll see digital clips, the campaign there, and 
that's where you go. And you can see our update. You can see uh, people's reviews and the discussions going on. It's really good. If you're thinking about investing, go read the discussions because there's a lot of dialogue about how it works, what you can expect and everything there. Because I encourage everybody, if you're thinking about investing, like any other investment, it's all at risk. I don't want, like, we feel very confident we're going to get everything over, but I don't want to make sure that people who are coming here because they're fans of like games that we're trying to get and all that stuff. I don't want them to lose money or feel like they, like, this is all going to work out 100%. They need to be aware that this is still an at risk investment, but we're pretty confident we're going to pull this off and we explain how that works. But I just want them to be fully educated on it. I just hate for people to like put a lot of money in that maybe they don't really have in hopes of like encouraging us to like, if they're doing it because they want MVC two, and then if we don't get MVC two, that would stink. Like I, I want, I want people to be really educated about what this is, and so I, I, I want to make sure people are really understanding. Yeah, and just and so people are aware, um, Disney's not really known for being um, charitable with their properties, so uh, just brace for that as well. You know. Yeah, you got to look at all these as like really big shots in the dark. But with this money, what it does is it changes it changes variables for all parties. So usually in these situations, we would have three parties like say we're going to like a disney or some company like disney fox and all these guys um when you go to them they're not necessarily like publishers so they would find somebody else who would help fund and publish the game we would be the developer associated with it and disney would be the license holder the ip holder and that's a three-way very crazy often very tweaked split that happens but by eliminating the funding publisher it's really just down to two parties now which makes it more amicable for both of us and so it's it's opened up conversations to another level that we've never really had before. And it's it's actually turning into kind of a, a fun situation where we can talk to all these people we're talking to. It's like, oh, how, how do we how do we make you money? <laughs> because we have the money, you don't have to invest. We can do this and here's what you can expect on returns. And do you just want to say yes? Because if you say yes, you don't have to, the kind of work we do, they don't have to have much oversight. It's actually just a matter of like, are they willing to like trust us with their IP? 